Uh, good evening, good afternoon, good morning to all our participants for this uh, webinar, the Food and Nutrition Security webinar organized by African Academy of Sciences um, and supported by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and also SIDA, uh, the uh, Swedish International uh, Development Agency. Um, we are also in partnership with uh, AUDA, the African Union uh, Development Agency. Um, could we have the slides, please, so that our participants can be able to get uh, some few instructions about uh, this particular webinar? So we have assembled um, an eminent and distinguished speakers for this particular webinar. And uh, the beauty about this assembly is that uh, um, it's a small group of experts who've come together to actually discuss um, different issues, but essentially start the process of uh, putting together a project for food, nutrition, security in Africa. Next slide, please. And uh, I'd like to introduce my co-moderator for this presentation. Uh, her name is uh, Grace Mwaura, and uh, you'll be hearing her voice a little bit later uh, in this uh, broadcast. Next slide, please. So just a, a few meeting objectives uh, before I hand over to uh, the executive director of the African Academy of Sciences, Professor Nelson Toto. Um, it is important that uh, we know we, we are convening this diverse group of experts in food and nutrition security uh, from across uh, you know, the African continent with a few invitees from outside the continent so that they can assist the African Academy of Sciences put together research and development priorities for the African continent. From you as an expert in this particular area, we are looking forward to your participation in the deliberations. Um, there's an opportunity to actually react to the keynote presentation and also the panel discussions in the group chats and also the Q&A sessions of the webinar. Um, all of it will be recorded. We are recording this um, and we are also capturing whatever it is that you will write in the chat function. And then we will definitely put these, all these ideas together and uh, they will assist us in rolling out um, a more uh, widespread survey that we will send to food and nutrition experts on the continent to, in a way, um, react on what you would have put on the table as priorities for Africa. And uh, we do have a rapporteur who will eventually put together everything that we would have said, everything that the survey would have said uh, into a consolidated report that the various different stakeholders will use going forward. Next slide, please. So um, at this juncture, I would like to uh, just give you a few instructions about um, uh, GoToWebinar. So GoToWebinar may not be as uh, intuitive as what some of you are probably used to. Um, so you're all on mute. If you want to uh, uh, ask a question, there's a Q&A area uh, for you to actually do that. Uh, and then there's also a chat function for you to uh, put down anything that uh, you would like to uh, tell us about as we go on with this particular exercise. A little bit later in this um, broadcast, there'll be an opportunity for you to ask questions, um, oral questions or written questions. Um, and then eventually we will capture all your thoughts uh, using a polling tool, Mentimeter. Some of you will uh, have already known about it. Um, but uh, eventually we will give you instructions on how to deal with it when we get to that particular prioritization exercise. So without further ado, 
I'd like to uh, invite um, the Executive Director, Professor Nelson Toto, to give us our welcome address. Uh, welcome, Nelson. Thank you very much, Moses, and uh, thank you very much to everyone for having uh, joined uh, this webinar. Uh, it's really a great privilege for us as the African Academy of Sciences in partnership with uh, the African Union Development Agency uh, in terms of uh, bringing this uh, engagement, which we feel that is very critical because of the fact that we want to be able to assist uh, the African governments in their, in their efforts to find or uh, determine the best priorities that they can focus on so that they can get the best value for money in terms of their investments in, in, in research. Uh, can I have the next slide? Can I have the next slide, please? So, you know, for the benefit of those of you who might not know what the African Academy of Sciences is and or, or who we are, the African Academy of Sciences is an academy of all sciences. So we uh, incorporate all disciplines uh, from the pure sciences to medicine to law to uh, social sciences and humanities. Uh, we are the only pan-African academy in the continent. We're a non-aligned, non-political, and not-for-profit pan-African organization. And what we do, we want to do it for the benefit of the Africans in the continent. Uh, by virtue of our distribution, we have got offices in the five regions of the African continent. Uh, this is where our vice presidents are. And of course, the whole uh, governing body of the African Academy of Sciences is led by a president who is Professor Felix da Pera da Coro. Uh, so we are the only um, continental academy with the support of and recognition of the African Union. And for that reason, we work very, very closely with the African Union Development Agency, which you know it was formerly called NEPAD. Uh, we have a vision, which is to transform lives through science. Science is very, very important. And as I said earlier on, the science that we are talking about is this, the, 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 the science that em encompasses all the disciplines uh, that are, are, are possible. So our mission is to leverage resources through research excellence and thought leadership for sustainable development. Uh, can I have the next slide? Next slide, please. So it is very, very important that we are gathered today uh, because of the fact that we have brought uh, together experts uh, from different parts of the world. And clearly, the objective is that we want to be able to uh, set scientific priorities for the continent, as I said. And we feel that the best way to do it is to engage. We want to engage with everyone. Uh, fortunately, even though we are not able to travel and, and meet face to face, uh, we have now learned through COVID that we can actually be able to engage through webinars, and we are seeing this as a very successful way of being able to uh, to engage with different people in different places. Uh, so just to give you some highlight of what we were able to do last year, uh, this project of certain priorities started last year, and um, in, in, um, in 2019, the, the scientific priorities that we focused on uh, were maternal health, and maternal, neonatal, and child health, uh, human genetics and genomics, uh, biospecimen and data governance, as well as climate change. And of course, climate change is one of those areas that devastate the African continent very much. We are the most sensitive, we are the most affected when it comes to climate change. So the focus for this year in terms of the scientific priorities um, has been epidemic preparedness, and we actually did not even have a chance to make a choice because COVID is here and we've had to embark on COVID. We have had uh, webinars, we've had consultations, and we've also been able to engage with some of our funders, including CEDA, to really redirect some of the funding that we have so that we can fund some projects on, on COVID-related uh, 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 scientific initiatives. Today, obviously, the focus is on food and nutrition security, uh, which is really key. And later on in the year, we are going to embark on other webinars and engagements where we will look into the fourth industrial re revolution because we know the future is digital. We cannot run away from it. We need to make sure that Africa is, is prepared. And of course, gender and science, uh, the girl child is the one that suffers most. I'm happy to see that we have got, uh, uh, girl children on the panel. It's very key because you inspire us and we want to continue to do more. 
uh, as the African Academy of Sciences, mental health is something that is very, uh, very key. Uh, we know in the past, historically in the continent, you know, if a child had a mental issue, they were always going to be kept at the back of the house. But clearly we've seen that mental health is affecting people at highest level. And this is something that we need to face and be able to address and actually help our governments to try and address this issue. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. So there are two programs really at the African Academy of Sciences, one that is led by Grace Mahura and the other one which is led by Moses. One of the things that we've been able to do is to drive innovation and we drive innovation at the African Academy of Sciences through our Grand Challenges Africa uh, program. This is where we really uh, bring together anyone and everyone who has got good ideas and we try to incentivize them to be able to drive different aspects. Uh, we have had several calls. We have had calls on MNCH, as I said earlier on. We have had calls on antimicrobial resistance, and this was a, a combined call uh, with our Indian colleagues. We have had calls on drug discovery driven from Cape Town. We have had calls that address issues on water and sanitation. And recently, in fact, there was a call which was supposed to close today, but I think it has been extended, the call on transition to scale, uh, which is very, very important because we don't just want to fund uh, ideas that are just going to be uh, uh, explored without necessarily looking into how we can actually scale them up so that Africa can be, begin to be part of the production uh, uh, process. So this is one of our important calls for this year. So through the support of the uh, Melinda, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, as well as CEDA, uh, we have had um, uh, a focus on these areas where clearly uh, we are trying to encourage as much innovation as possible. So in 2020, uh, food and nutrition and, and security call is going to be the first one that we are going to embark on. We still need to advance some issues on MNCH. And again, there will be a call on transition to scale, uh, drug discovery. And of course, I think the key aspect is that we want to, we are driven by the SDGs, but obviously Africa has come up with its own strategies. So we have got STISA, we have got Agenda 2063, and want to make sure that we are there for the African governments so that as they begin to put some more money into research, they can begin to know which areas are critical and which areas would uh, bring more value uh, for, the, for the citizens. I think I've got the last slide. Next slide. Oh yeah, no, that was the, the last one. So I think in, in, in summary, we are very excited that um, everyone could join and we look forward to this engagement, I think because of the fact that it will bring important results that we can begin now in partnership with AUDA, uh, begin to engage the African governments so that they can uh, know how to stretch the little money that has been left after the COVID crisis. So I look forward to hearing all your excellent views and I look forward to the engagement and thank you very much for making time to participate in this webinar. Back to you, Moses. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Nelson Toto for that um, warm welcome for, for everybody. I, I hope you're feeling um, as warm as I am. And um, without much ado, I'd like to invite our keynote speaker. Um, our keynote speaker is Professor Elian Obaligioro, the Executive Director of Clear International Development uh, Incorporated. Uh, she's um, Director of Programs at Global Open Data in Agriculture, Gordon, and uh, a Professor of Practice for Public and Private Sector Partnerships at McGill's University Institute uh, for the study of uh, international development, um, where at some point she co-led the Bill and Melinda Gates Grand Challenges Exploration Grants in Agriculture and Health. She is also a member of Rwanda's National Science and Technology Council and a member of the Crop Trust Executive Board. And of course, by extension, a member of the Presidential Advisory Council for the Rwandan President, uh, Honorable uh, His Excellency Paul Kagame. Uh, Eliane is also a fellow of the African Academy of Sciences. Uh, Eliane, we know that you're joining us all the way from Montreal. Uh, we are really happy that uh, you've been able to join us. Uh, so over to you, Eliane. Thank you.
Elian, um, you're, you're on mute. Uh, so just please unmute yourself and then the stage will be yours. Okay, great. So can hear you now. to be here with all of you today. I'm, I'm very excited to be um, talking about uh, food and nutrition security in Africa, especially at this time of the world. And so what I will be sharing is my experiencing around advancing food and nutrition security in Africa. And I will be talking about harnessing climate resist, resilient practices and data. And I know the next theme, uh, you mentioned the fourth industrial revolution. So I think this will be a really good transition. And, and also because I'm a woman and I'm a female scientist, I'm a mother, um, going from the priorities that AAS had last year to where it's moving in uh, in 2020, I think this is a nice bridge. So just to start out, I think it's really important to know that world population is growing at a rate that will require us to find ways of feeding the world in sustainable ways, in ways that we have not reached yet. And if you look at the projections, it's very clear that most of the births around the world between now and 2050 are going to be in Africa. And so how we're going to deal with this, especially of the African Academy of Sciences in terms of how we advise policymakers, how we lead an in innovation and in science in Africa will be critical on our capacity to feed Africa and feed the world. And so I, I've had the honor in the last um, few months to uh, participate in a number of um, brainstormings and one particular one with the African Development Bank. What was very interesting is to realize that in terms of Africa's yields, Africa's yields are 56% of international average. There's a lot we can do to increase agricultural productivity in Africa to meet our food security needs. And this is really important in terms of realizing that Africa's participation in global agricultural commodity and value added market only hovers around 2%. So there is a lot of room for improvement and there's a lot of room to really include science in this uh, advancement. If we look at global food security, the continent that is most affected in the world is Africa. And it was interesting for me to learn a few weeks ago on one of these brainstorming of the African Development Bank that only 13.5 of African soils are responsive to fertilizers. This is really critical. In, 2015, in 2018 already, there were over 256 million people that were suffering from food insecurity in Africa. And so with COVID-19 and how this is creating limitations in terms of trade and circulation of people and goods, this can really uh, advance to a very alarming rate. And so it's really important for us to realize what are the important levers we need to work on. Recently, I was able to take part in a listen-in on a high-level cardinal organized by FAO on soils. And, and what we need to understand is in order to increase food security and nutrition in Africa, we need to deal with this 13.5% level of fertility of African soils and bring it up to 100%. And part of it is realizing that soil is a really valuable natural capital but one third of global soils are degraded. And this is particularly true in Africa. And how we look at this in terms of the interaction between soil and climate regulation, in terms of the microbial biodiversity that can be sources of pharmaceutical and genetic resources, provision of food and fuel, importance of soils in terms of water purification and uh, reduction of soil contaminants. The importance of soil is in terms of carbon sequestration, cultural heritage, nutrient cycling, habitat for organisms, and provision of construction materials is really critical. And coming from Rwanda, we have suffered a, a number of major floods over the last six months. So flood regulation is really important. And our quality of soils is really critical to that and for foundation for human infrastructure. So the 2020 prize, the World Food Prize, went to Dr. Ratan Lalal. And his work is really all around soil management practices tailored to each world region to effectively resoil soil health. Why does this matter? Because if we can restore soil health in Africa, we can change the level of productivity to ensure food security and better nutrition for our whole populations. So what is needed is a shift from practices that deplete soils and carbon, organic carbon in soils in Africa to regenerative practices that instead of competing with nature, partner with nature, instead of disturbing soils, protect soils. And instead of having monocultures, having diversified holistic paradigm that not only increase our food productivity, but the 
quality of nutrition and also increase our effort to conserve the biodiversity. Africa has 26% of global biodiversity. And this is critical not only to feeding our population, but also to our potential in terms of health sovereignty to tap into our uh, um, agri uh, our diversity in terms of biodiversity, in terms of uh, health solutions. And I know Charles Mbebe will talk about that more later. And so one of the things we have to know is we do have African leadership in regenerative agriculture. So two years ago, I had the honor of meeting Professor Godfrey Zamujo, who's Nigerian and has been leading the Shanghai Regional Center that is a really um, innovative and pioneering center in Africa around regenerative agriculture. And their examples in terms of how we look at agriculture in terms of the circular economy is one that all of us need to familiarize ourselves with. I would also like to share with you the experience I've had with um, leaders in India, in Andhra Pradesh, looking at the zero budget natural farming. And zero budget natural farming is a really interesting potential for Africa, because not only does it address several SDG goals, but what we know in terms of the over 10 year experience in India is that every investment of $1 will produce $13 in benefit. Just remember, around 60% of the population in Africa contributes to agriculture, but that only represents 30% of the GDP. So we have a lot of potential to have agriculture harness for food security, for improved biodiversity, increasing climate resilience, and all the added benefits that we know that um, regenerative agriculture can bring to the continent. So what's important, I also just wanted to share, as the Deputy Executive Director of Global Open Data and Agriculture and Nutrition, we have over 1,100 partners around the world in 117 countries, and half of those partners are in Africa. So there's a lot of intelligence at the interface of agriculture, nutrition, and data in Africa that we can tap into. And so what really matters in terms of how we harness this interface of food productivity, nutrition, is how are we looking at the data that's being produced on the continent in terms of data quality, provenance, timeliness, accessibility, and interoperability. This will allow us to look at ways we can harness regenerative agriculture in Africa in ways that increase our productivity. Because right now, Africa is at a level of agriculture productivity that at best is a quarter of global averages, and this needs to change. And so one of the things we've been doing at Godan is, is encouraging open data management in agriculture and nutrition. And, and we've produced modules that are available in English and now that are also available in French or being translated in a number of other languages to help researchers in agriculture and nutrition harness open data and use it to really allow harnessing data for agriculture productivity. And why does this matter? So here are the African realities we deal with. On average, farmers in Africa are 59 years old. So this is a very aging population. And you think about, we have a very young population on the continent. And these farmers have less than two hectares in most cases, and a lot have less than one hectare. And only 20% of what they produce is sold. And so combination of population explosion, climate change, and aging farmer population really creates conditions that uh, COVID-19 is making really fragile on the continent. And at the same time, we know the links between biodiversity loss and zoonosis that leads to the type of pandemic we're going through. And at the same time, there's a digital divide. This aging population has not only the difficulty of producing what we need for the whole continent, but also we need to harness um, data and, and the fourth industrial revolution to really ensure that we have all the um, data mobilized to ensure Africa's food security. And so part of it is what does data do? And in, particularly in terms of food nutrition and security, the, just accessing geospatial satellite data, weather and market has shown to improve farmer incomes by 30%. But additional data can be harnessed by farmers, data around infestations, disease equipment, socioeconomic empowerment, optimized agricultural practices, production costs, being able to manage sales and profits, improve nutrition, disaster prevention, and improving livelihoods. So how agriculture and nutrition are being harnessed in relation to data has to be critical to our pathway forward. And it's really important to, for this integration to happen and to happen now, especially as we're facing COVID-19. 
And so one of it, one one of the areas that this is does is in terms of being able for farmers to access real time data on how are productive are their soils, what is needed to improve their soil qualities, and this is critical to also allow all farmers and pastoralists to connect to global and local markets. So for example, the STAMP project in Mali connects pastoralists so they can share with each other where the next water holes are available. They can share information on animals that they have for sale. And this can allow them to connect to uh, economies and markets in ways that integrate pastoralists that in ways that was not possible in the past. So it's really important also that women be at the center of food security, nutrition, and digitalization. So for example, this project in, in Ghana has helped female smallholder farmers connect and be more productive in terms of their cocoa farming and be able to have improved um, livelihoods to be able to feed their children better. We know that levels of malnutrition in Africa are much higher than elsewhere in the world. And it's really critical that as we innovate to be able to feed the continent, that we do so in ways that empower women to access technology and empower youth to be excited about being involved in agriculture in ways that harness all the different levels of knowledge we have access to today. So what's really critical for me is really how do we use data to revolutionize how we feed the world, our planet, and the generations to come? And what's important for me to share with all of you is that it's really critical to realize that if we can just in terms of the three elements I showed earlier that were critical to increasing livelihoods by 30%, if we're able to mobilize all the different types of knowledges that farmers can have access to, we can critically improve farmer livelihoods and we can improve GDPs of countries in Africa. Right now, what we the projections are that by 2025, Africa will be importing $110 billion worth of food. If harnessing regenerative agriculture, better effective use of data, we are able to compensate. This is money that instead of going outside of the continent can help us increase our capacity to feed our continent, our capacity to employ our youth, our capacity to harness technology in ways that will increase prosperity in the continent and at the same time have sustainable agriculture productivity that feeds our children, increases the rates of nutrition, decreases the rates of stunting in our young people to ensure that our youth are prepared to harness the future, contribute to climate resilience, and ensure that the continent feeds itself and contributes to the preservation of biodiversity. Thank you. So I will switch back to Moses. Okay, Moses, you're able to. Take it back. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Elian Valijoro, um, for those um, comments. Uh, truly appreciated, especially on the point of integration and uh, this particular area of uh, priority setting that we are talking about actually having a chance to contribute towards national development uh, and uh, by large our regions and also the continent. Uh, so, so thank you so much for that. I'm sure um, some of the participants are looking forward to asking you one or two questions. Uh, so we will uh, definitely have you back uh, when we get to the panel uh, question and answer session. Thanks again, uh, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this. So um, we switch on to um, an uh, eminent and distinguished panel. Uh, that uh, we've been looking forward to hearing. Uh, they are going to be focusing on various different uh, aspects of uh, uh, the keynote presentation. And uh, to start us off is uh, Professor Charles Wandebe. Um, professor Charles is a professor extraordinaire at uh, Tswana University of Technology, Pretoria, and consultant to the WHO on traditional medicine. Um, Charles has also worked with various different organizations, um, but it's important to mention that uh, he was a recipient of the TWAS Prizes in Medical Sciences and Building Scientific Institutions in Africa, 
Uh, he served as a consultant for various different bodies and was pioneer pro-chancellor and chairman of Bingham University in Nigeria. Uh, he was the president and founder of the International Biomedical Research in Africa. He's a fellow of the Nigerian Academy of Sciences and uh, the African Academy of Sciences. And uh, indeed, he's the chair of uh, um, the programs committee for food and nutrition here at the African Academy of Sciences. So welcome, uh, Professor Charles Wambebe. So Charles, um, we'll give you an opportunity to uh, get off mute, uh, turn your video on, and then um, we can move the slides for you. Thank you, Wycliffe, uh, for putting on uh, Charles' slides. So, Charles, we are waiting for you when you're ready. Oh, can you hear me now? Hello? Yes, we can. Um, okay. We can hear you, Charles. It will also be nice if we can see you, uh, if uh, oh, okay. you can put on. I do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. This uh, wonderful stuff. I can welcome. Okay. Can you see me now? You sure to see me now. Share my webcam. Yes. Well, okay. You can on. see me now. Okay. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank, Thank you so, so much, much. Uh, Professor. Over to you. Thank you. Uh -huh. How do I change the slide from this side? Right. We will move this. Or you wish. Hello. No. I think. Oh, sorry. Prof, you can change the slides from your end. We've given you control uh, for the keyboard and mouse. My keyboard. It's not working from my keyboard. I don't know why. It's not working from my keyboard. Okay, then. We then can maybe. take the control of the slides and do it for you. Okay. Sorry, um, are you 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 control the slides? Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Moses and uh, Nessin and Grace and uh, Elian and everyone. The panel uh, is um, a wonderful thing for us to have this uh, as a priority this year. Mine was is food and um, food as medicine. Uh, the father of medicine said, that's hypocrisy. Let food be thy medicine, and medicine thy food. And the Bible also, in two references, said the same thing many years back. So let us see how they are connected. Next slide, please. Next slide, okay. Then uh, last year, UNICEF report indicated that when we invest $1 in feeding a child correctly, uh, especially the first 1,000 years, I mean 1,000 days, that will generate $45 in social economic benefits. So it is a very wise investment to feel, endeavor to feel the child wisely. Nutrition and balance, nutrition. Next slide, please. Um, there is uh, this uh, NUS stands for the neglected underutilized species, both crops and edible insects. The benefits are just being realized in terms of uh, their diversity for diet, and they also address micronutrient deficiencies, especially the hidden hunger. And they create opportunities, especially in our rural economic development through the development of value chains along all the various parameters of this NUS. Next slide, please. 
Next, okay. Um, one of the of this uh, neglected underutilized species in Africa are the edible insects. I know perception, cultural orientation uh, is a huge uh, impediment to moving in this direction, but the science is very clear. The environmental advantages of insects are awesome. The edible share, the feed uh, we can get from it, the water footprint, and uh, the land use, it is superior to cattle, to uh, uh, pork and chicken. So it's an area that we need to look at more closely. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, according to the WHO, African nations, the non-communicable diseases are rising rapidly. And indeed, they will exceed communicable, maternal, perinatal, and nutritional diseases as the common causes of death by 2030. We are not far from that. Although we are still not where we should be when it comes to the prevalence of communicable diseases, but the non-communicable diseases are just rising. And that's where we need to look at food as sources of medicine, especially in the area of preventive uh, uh, non-communicable diseases. Next slide, please. Well, this is, I'm not going to go into details of it. It is just letting us know the, the various possibilities we can get um, benefits, health benefits, hair promoting and disease preventing proper uh, um, agents, uh, which are normally referred to as secondary metabolites from food plants. Uh, apart from the, the indirect one, which is the, uh, the, the, the improving essential uh, the minerals and the micronutrients. They have specific secondary metabolites in the food that we eat that can also have direct impact in our health. Next, next slide, please. Okay, I'm just going to share uh, two, um, you know, these are clinical data now of direct relationship between food and medicine or health. Uh, this one was uh, is, is some is a food a food meal that my one of my younger colleagues, I believe, is on this webinar. He did his PhD on this in London, where he, he formulated the food in Nigeria, but then uh, and did also the clinical trial in Nigeria and using HIV AIDS patients. And you can see the 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 the, the effect on viral load very dramatic, you know, very consistent, and uh, the quality of life of the patients also uh, very high. And those who are already on ART, they benefited to the extent that their doctors had to reduce their, their doses. Next slide, please. Then the second example I'll give you a connect directly between, the, the last example is a connection between food as medicine in respect to communicable disease, HIV is. Now, this is a non-communicable disease, sickle cell anemia, which uh, affect over 20 million Africans, mainly children. Unfortunately, most of them die in villages without even being diagnosed. Well, this is a project I started this year, using again food, uh, extract of food. I just extract water extract of food we eat in Nigeria. And uh, the, this slide shows various doses of the of the, uh, of the compound, not comp of the mixture, that it reversed the red blood cell cycling. The, when the red blood cell cycles in a patient suffering from sickle cell anemia, that's when the, the patient now will go into crisis and with time, if uh, it's not properly managed, will die from that because the tissues are being denied oxygen. And you can see this one made from food is a phytomedicine standardized is able to reverse the cycling of the red blood cell. The next slide, please. Which is the last, no, not the last. Thing. Yeah, this one is the aspect of inhibiting the red blood cell from being cycled. The, the last slide shows that a patient who is already, you know, having some crisis can use this uh, product and be able to reverse it in the hospital. But this one, it, it means that the same product, based, food based, can actually be a prophylactic. It can be used to prevent because it inhibits the cycling of red blood cells. The last slide, please. 
Last night. Okay, it is just uh, suggesting the way forward which involves the government, the private sector, and the academics. And I'm happy the African Academy of Science has taken the lead in this. So I know we're going to go somewhere. Thank you so much uh, for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Charles Swambebe. Uh, really interesting presentation. I am wishing that uh, we had a bit more time to, to listen to you because uh, um, I'm, I'm just thinking there's a lot more behind those particular slides that we can definitely discuss. Uh, but it's quite clear that uh, you know food as medicine in the various different areas that you've mentioned, NCD, um, sickle cell disease, HIV, uh, probably has got a place. Um, and I've also noticed that um, um, Baldwin Toto is, is on the line. Uh, he is from Isipe uh, here in Nairobi, and they do quite a bit of uh, um, you know, research on uh, insects as food. Uh, we are hoping to probably hear a comment from him a bit later. So thanks again for that uh, brilliant presentation. So um, our next presenter is uh, Larry Umuna. Larry is the Regional Director, West Africa at Technosav. Uh, it's always important to uh, you know, get a message from uh, you know, groups and people who are connected to uh, business and also connected to the private sector in a way that uh, Larry is. Uh, Larry is join, uh, joined Technosav in 2015 as country director for Nigeria. He previously served as the first regional representative for Africa and country director Nigeria for Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, GAIN. And uh, uh, currently he oversees the design, development and implementation of Technosav programs across West Africa and he is responsible for leading and coordinating efforts to position the organization as the most effective catalyst and partner for transformative on the ground market-based solutions to poverty and mobilizing public and private sector investments for agriculture and food processing. So um, his connection to entrepreneurship and also sustainable livelihood programs, uh, something that was also mentioned by the keynote speaker, Elian, uh, is something that we would like to listen to. Uh, so over to you. Thank you so much, Moses. I hope you can see me and you can hear me clearly. Uh, yes, we can. Thank you. Great. So um, I'd like to thank the African Academy of Sciences for inviting me to this, to this webinar. Um, it's important to state that my perspectives um, are shaped by my experience in engaging with, um, with the African food industry. Uh, it's also influenced uh, by my experience uh, at Technoself and the work we do in providing business solutions to poverty. If we ask, um, uh, oh, 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 let me wind back. In, in 2016, there was a very lovely book that was, um, that was launched um, called Good, uh, Good Nutrition Perspectives for the 21st Century. And in the in a section of that book, two professors, Professor Glennon and Professor Fanzo, actually talked about the 10 key forces that shape the global food system. And if you look at those 10 key forces, those are forces and those are um, issues that the food industry takes into consideration whenever they are designing their strategies. The, the ag industry as, as well, the ag sector would also look at these key, these key forces. And I'm sure if we ask these professors to, um, uh, to ask them the same question again, they would include COVID-19 because COVID-19 certainly has contributed to shaping the global food system. Positively, negatively, that's a, diff a different question entirely. But it is also very important that when we are talking about market-based solutions uh, to the issues of foods and nutrition security, then we look at it from a food systems perspective. It's the industry would always, um, um, the industry which who is uh, the industry players who are active participants in the food system 
would look at things around food storage, around um, retailing, around the agricultural production system. So industry looks at things from a food system perspective. And so that is, that is, it is also very important that we do that as well when we're having this, these conversations. But let us, let us first look at why, why, why would industry be interested in this subject? And what are the key challenges that they face and these challenges could also be opportunities. Population growth, the keynote speaker already talked about that. How do we feed um, the extra number of people that would come up uh, um, on the continent? The challenging nutrition situation, a situation where one out of every three African children under the age of five are chronically malnourished, are stunted. It's a big issue. And, and the link between stunting and GDP growth, the link between stunting and productivity has already been established. We also know that the food industry tends to design products and, uh, mainly for the high income market. And those at the, at the base of the pyramid are usually treated as targets for food donation. Maybe we might be, for, we might be lucky that many donors are now moving towards trade, not aid. But how do we see these low income people as a market? The other point to also note is the poor intra-Africa trade. Within Africa itself, less than 50% intra-Africa trade um, um, happens compared to Europe where you have 67% of trade within that particular continent. Again, the African uh, free continental free trade agreement might be the saving grace here. But there's the issue of value addition. The value addition could be a problem because we as we as sending out significant uh, quantities of our crops out of the continent and buy, and bring them back as finished products. Um, Thirty five billion dollars spent on food importation in 2016 into the continent. The keynote speaker told us that in, by, in, in the next few years we're talking about one hundred and ten billion dollars. But we need to deal with the issue of value addition. Post harvest losses, also a big problem. We lose between 30 and 50% of produce are lost by smallholder farmers before they actually leave the, leave the farm gate. And processors face issues around sustainable sourcing. It's about supply chain, it's about access to finance, it's about sales and distribution, it's about workforce development. And, and so in, in designing, in trying to figure out where the opportunities are for us to improve, we need to first look, 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 let's look at the value chain. There's been lots of exciting and innovative work that has been done by scientists on the continent to improve food and nutrition security along this value chain. But we still need to do a lot more work, a lot more work around our seed systems. Do we have the optimum right seed system? Do we have, uh, as, as biofortification, answered all the questions that we need to, uh, uh, that we have around its ability to be able to deliver food to everybody in the right form? Are there unanswered questions around biofortification? Are there unanswered questions around the seed systems? Post-harvest losses <laughs> that we talked about earlier, some good work done there, but we still need some more technology that is affordable and accessible to every, everybody. And so if we look at these various boxes in this framework put together by Fanzo and Co, and we dig deep into each of these, we would be able to find more questions and more answers and lots of questions and gaps that would provide information for on, on what do we really need to do to get Africa out of the current doldrums that it, that, that it has. I'm sure that we can actually feed this growing population. Innovation, um, lots of innovation will be required. The industry has a role to play there and um, lots of R&D along that value chain. So in addition to those areas, those boxes that I mentioned around seeds and inputs and biofortification and uh, 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 post-harvest losses, there are other ideas as well. And some of these ideas are not, may not be, should not be new to many people. Um, and I'm, I was very glad listening to the keynote speaker when she talked about data, big data, big data, information is money. Data about people, data about environment, data about health and diets, 
are extremely very important, especially if they are utilized on AI platforms to create low-cost strategies that would help address some of these food and nutrition security issues. A lot of work still needs to be done there. The key, uh, it could also be used for formulation of new products, targeting especially those at the base of the pyramid. The key question here is to what extent is it open enough and accessible to the industry or to enable them maximize the benefits of big data. The other thing that we need to start thinking about, and there's already some movement there, and I think we won't have any choice with COVID-19 now, digitized solutions will actually be the way to go. We are seeing more e-commerce trading, we're seeing more online retail. And we need to now move away from the paper trails to more transparent digital records. We need to now see, and we're beginning to see, digital marketplaces for nutritious foods, for nutritious crops, for services as well. And this is an area where we know that the investments into trying to understand blockchain could help revolutionize the supply chain challenges faced by the industry. It would also help deal with issue of traceability, which addresses a food safety question. Now, as uh, um, uh, um, uh, as complicated as it sounds, it is already being done. A commodity trader in South Africa, Louis Dresfo, used, used blockchain technology as far back as 2016 when exporting 60,000 metric tons of soybean to China. We have companies like Cellulant, which has an operation in Kenya and an operation in Nigeria, setting up digital marketplaces uh, uh, from, from, one, from end to end receiving orders and right up to the payment systems and ensuring that all the actors in that digital in that marketplace are all captured and are all active on that marketplace a lot of work needs to go on there as well um, the other thing that we also could begin to think about it's not really new but perhaps we need to put some more investment and and the resources into is the whole issue of vertical farming um, with urbanization and uh, everybody running out of the uh, out of the rural areas to the big city, perhaps this is an area where we need to understand what are those gaps and what are those things that we need to do to actually make vertical farming much more sustainable. I was also very pleased to hear Professor Wambebe talk about insects because I was wondering how, how do I bring up this topic here. But it's quite clear that investments to promote uh, dietary patterns that are high in protective foods will be good investments with great returns on investment. It's only logical that we need to begin to look at issues of fruits, uh, uh, foods like fruits, vegetables, legumes, and all grains, but also begin to look at insect and plant-based proteins. I talked about our nutrition situation on the continent, which still needs, which still needs some, uh, some more attention. And so putting some investment and trying to understand what is it that we need to do to make consumption of these protective foods much more uh, uh, to increase, it's something that would be extremely very useful. And of course, there are lots of other ideas around cellular agriculture that, and God, that I would not want to talk about. But the, the point here on, in, in terms of design principles, it's important for us that when we are designing that we don't look at just the symptoms, but we look at the, uh, the whole food system approach and say, what, 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 how would it affect and what, how would it uh, um, affect the entire food system? We also need to begin to look at uh, designing from an aspirational point of view. Africa for a long time had been the dumping ground for, 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 for foods and aids. But I think the time has come for us to basically take our own fate in our hands and begin to look at things from a more aspirational point of view. How do we challenge the African food industries to design products that would be used by Africans that, would, that matches our cultural settings, but more importantly, also addresses the nutritional needs of Africans. And that means that we also need to begin to think about not just micronutrients, but also be looking at all other nutrients and understanding those other nutrients that are available and see how they feed into uh, um, um, our own uh, peculiarities here on, on the continent. Lastly, is for us to be able to think about how we communicate these benefits properly 
and not just not just focus on short term imp um, impacts. How do we communicate these long term benefits, and how do we sell it to various stakeholders? Uh, um, how do you get private sector involved? How do you communicate it to them? But even more importantly, how do we communicate to the consumer and let them understand why the industry is moving in this particular direction? Um, my last slide is basically talks about partnership. It means one with the key message here is nobody can do it alone. I'm very grateful for the African Academy of Sciences for setting up this webinar, but I'm sure the African uh, the AAS would need collaboration, um, food industry, private sector, everybody's got to be involved, uh, uh, the donors, the researchers, the scientists, and the, the parting words, uh, two quotes, um, the first one talks about teamwork, which speaks to the issue of partnership, and the second one talk about, talks about the need for us to think out of the box, and a uh, very wise saying from, from Socrates, I say the secret of change is to focus all of all of your energy not on fighting the old but on building the new. Thank you so much. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much, Larry, for that uh, very insightful um, presentation. Um, I, I, I I totally agree with you uh, that uh, the market is a very interesting place to be. Um, I mean, you you just don't build uh, uh, say that you want to build a value chain uh, for the consumers if you're not maximizing the value chain for the investors too. Uh, so I mean, it's 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 interesting that you also talked about collaboration. So uh, truly looking forward to working with various different organizations on the call and also others not on the call to actually uh, put together this ambition that we have here at the African Academy of Sciences. So. Thanks again. So we'll move forward to our next uh, presenter. And uh, actually quite uh, happy and excited, uh, you know, when I met you, Namukolo. Uh, so, and it's good that uh, Dr. Namukolo Kovic uh, is our next presenter. Uh, she is a senior research coordinator at the International Food Policy Research Institute. She's based in uh, Ethiopia. Namukolo is a registered nutritionist with the Health Professional Council of South Africa and also a senior research coordinator at the International Food Policy Research Institute uh, for CGIR. I know most of you know what that is. Um, for the program on agriculture for nutrition and health. And uh, her work includes engaging with the African Union, the Ethiopian government, efforts that address food security and nutrition. Um, we know that uh, there is quite a bit of experience that you have uh, Namukolo that you can share with us. Uh, so the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Um, um, uh, thank you. Um, uh, so I need to speak uh, about, uh, thanks. So I'm going to speak about multidisciplinary research for a nutrition revolution in Africa because that's what we actually need um, to get us to where uh, we have desired nutrition and health outcomes. Next slide. So essentially what we have is multiple burdens of malnutrition on the African continent. Um, to the left there, what you are seeing is what has happened in reductions in stunting on the continent. While the reductions have been seen, this has been modest and it doesn't really get us to the targets that the continent has said, nor the global targets. To the right, what we are seeing is starting with under five children and the next set of bars on the five to 19 year olds and then finally the adult women, we are seeing an increase in overweight and obesity. The increase in, in overweight and obesity also um, shows the fact that we are actually not too different from what is happening elsewhere in the world. So here you can see Asia, Africa, 
Latin America, North America, and Oceania. And all these regions of the world are showing really high levels of uh, overweight. And I'm using women in particular for this slide because women are worse uh, affected on the continent uh, than men are. And then others have already spoken about non-communicable diseases. And to the right there, what you see is that while it looks as though we are still slightly on the lower side on overweight and obesity, when we look at um, high blood glucose as an indication of diabetes, um, here we are no different from the other areas. And this is the problem because we are reaching these high levels of non-communicable diseases at a point where our health systems are still relatively weak to address the, the situation. And then while, we are, while this is happening, again, we still see very high numbers uh, of hungry people on the African continent. And, re and in recent years, as you can see, the green circles there for Africa, uh, the numbers of hungry people in Africa have been increasing. This is a slide um, taken from the, the recent uh, Eat Lancet report that rattled people in the nutrition community as well as in the agriculture sector. Essentially, what they did was look at what it takes to have a healthy diet and also what it takes to have a diet that is good for the planet uh, in terms of staying within planetary boundaries, with respect to the environmental degradation and climate change. And essentially what they showed is that at that 100% dotted line of uh, a healthy boundaries, where we have the best health and nutrition outcomes is also the place where we would have uh, the best outcomes for the planet. And of course, when that came up, it, it brought about uh, quite a bit of um, controversy in that then everybody started saying, well, what about Africa? What about low and middle income countries? Are you wanting us to also not eat meat because we still need to eat more uh, animal source foods? And indeed, uh, we are not expected to do exactly the same as what is going on there. But what does the situation actually look like for Africa? So if you take the same scenario, and this is now sub-Saharan Africa, what you then see is that we are still consuming as a continent below that health boundary. However, we need to also keep in mind the fact that this is not everybody on the continent, that even on the African continent, we do have pockets of individuals, segments of the population that are already coming out of that health boundary. The issue though also is that there are certain things like uh, vegetables uh, where we are and legumes in particular, where uh, the African continent is consuming larger amounts than other continents. Uh, with the exception of, 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 of Asia, in particular India, because they consume a lot of pulses. But even for that, we are not reaching levels that are conducive for health. And therefore, the developments that we need in our food system need to help us to uh, attain better diets, more diverse diets, but preferably without then uh, swinging towards getting to this kind of trajectory that we are seeing for North America and for the other parts uh, of, of, of Europe and the like. So this is not ideal. So the issue then is, can we have a research agenda for Africa that allows us to uh, make a positive, positive development without uh, increasing the, on the negative side that we can actually avoid? Other parts of the world have already reached places where they're saying, oh, no, 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 this was not right. Maybe we need to do better. 
we are moving in that direction, but the issue is, can our research actually allow us to take a slightly different trajectory in a more positive direction? And so for our continents, with respect to diets in the middle there, we know that for the most part, we have very low diet diversity for the bulk of our population. We also know that we have significant challenges in terms of our consumer and food environments in the way in which they are affecting food choices, but even worse so in the way in which we are experiencing a dietary uh, transition that is now, as you have seen, leading us towards more prevalence of overweight and obesity and uh, non-communicable diseases. And this is happening at a time when we are still grappling with deficiencies of different nutrients, micronutrients, protein, and even energy. And therefore, our agriculture production system needs to, uh, to become diversified in such a way that we can provide a more diverse food basket uh, affordably. Then our food and storage at transport and trade uh, areas must also develop in such a way that they are supportive to being able to deliver a more affordable food basket. And all the business activities that are in there need to be informed by the final outcome that we are looking at, which is better nutrition and health outcomes. And then our food processing industries must also look at the type of development that take place to be conducive to supporting better nutrition and health outcomes. And then in our food retailing and provisioning sector, here is where we are often also bombarded with uh, messages that allow us to not make necessarily make the right uh, decisions. And so research for food and nutrition uh, security on the African continent really must address synergy and alignment across the food system. Having learned lessons from those that have gone before us. Um, so we must understand the prevailing landscape and our research should help us with this. We must pay attention to generate evidence, not only why our nutrition and health trends are going in the direction in which we are going, but also how we can do differently to meet uh, different outcomes. And in doing so, we need to make sure that our African academic institutions are actually better engaged in food and nutrition research uh, activities on the continent. Um, so the, these are the key messages that I would actually like us to, uh, to, to work with. The fact that nutrition and health should be considered outcomes of our current uh, food systems, but that we also must use them as opportunities to find ways of doing better. That Africa is facing multiple burdens of malnutrition, we must therefore address undernutrition while also mitigating against the negative impacts of dietary transition, which are manifesting in the form of overweight, obesity, and non-communicable diseases. And then that our agricultural development and economic growth that is so dependent on agriculture should lead to adequate diversification that can promote access to a more diverse food basket for these better nutrition and health outcomes. And that when we think about food security and nutrition and food systems research, these should be informed to be able to attain the desired outcomes, but this must be done with long-term uh, sustainability considerations to make sure that the type of land degradations that we are facing at the moment can be uh, mitigated and, and reversed where the situation is very bad. We have multiple opportunities on the continent within which we can embed food and nutrition security research. These include the scaling up nutrition uh, movement that 
many of our countries, at least 41 of our 54 African Union member states are, are implementing the Sun Movement. We have the Comprehensive Africa Agriculture Development Program, at least 44 of our countries are implementing that. On top of that, we now have the African Leaders for Nutrition uh, initiative that is working to uh, to encourage our, our heads of states to spend more on nutrition. And then we now have an African food safety index that is also an area of food safety where we need to actually do more. So our research uh, capacity must also include monitoring and evaluation and must be strengthened. And then finally, um, what I want to do is conclude by saying that we need transformative research, and this research needs to be multidisciplinary in nature, because as you have seen with the other speakers, there are multiple aspects that we need to address. We need research that transforms our food systems to support uh, positive nutrition and health outcomes. We need research that is informed by long-term sustainability consideration for the needed resource base. And we also need research on how to develop and sustain the needed research capacity for continued progress on our continent. If we do this for the Af African Academy of Sciences, you will then help us transform our food systems on the continent. Thank you. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much, uh, Namukolo, for that. Um, indeed, we are under, you know, an epidemiological transition um, and diversified food systems uh, to influence choice by the consumer is probably what we we, we need to look after. So our last presenter before we go to our question and answer. So just checking, um, Sunita, I know um, we had a few problems technically at the beginning, but just checking that you're online so that uh, we can give you an opportunity to uh, talk to us within a few minutes for the time that we, are, we, we have remaining. Uh, Sunita, are you, are you here? So just to tell you who our last presenter is, and then we will check again uh, to see if she's available. Uh, she's Professor Sunita Fakna from University of Mauritius. Uh, she's a professor in sustainable agriculture in the Faculty of Agriculture, University of Mauritius, and a twice over doctorate uh, because she holds two PhDs, one from the UK and one from Mauritius. Uh, she was Dean of the Faculty of Agriculture, University of Mauritius from 2015 to 2018. Uh, it will be nice if we can hear from you, but uh, if not, then uh, we'll proceed to the question and answer session with the panelists. So I'll check again. Uh, Sunita, did you manage to join us? Sunita, are you there? Okay, then. So um, let's let's uh, proceed to the question and answer session, um, of which um, I am going to be handing over to my uh, colleague, uh, moderator Grace Mwaura, and uh, we'll talk to you a little bit later for an exciting session where we now hear back from you for the prioritization. Uh, session. Grace. Uh, thank you very much, Moses, uh, and thanks to everyone for the presentations that we have listened to and those of you who continue to engage us through the question tab. I encourage all of you who have been listening in to type in your questions so that we can have the panelists uh, respond to this. Uh, this evening's presentations have been exciting because of the diversity that they bring on board. We, we started with uh, Professor Elian Balijoro, who talked about uh, uh, resilient agriculture and, and how we may achieve that on the continent. And to me, I could, I could hear her talking more and more about uh, food sovereignty on the continent, how that might look like. Um, 
and which is also uh, revolutionary. And we moved on to listen to Professor Charles Wabebe in particular interest on food as, me as medicine, and he touched on, on traditional uh, and cultural issues and how that affects our food and nutrition habits and diets and how we might use that to revolutionize how we achieve our targets on the African continent. Uh, then we moved on to Larry, who focused on what we need to do at the industry sector. And for me, this is particularly important, not because we first need to have the food, but also it's a way of creating employment as the, as the population keeps on increasing on the continent. We have a chance to, uh, to achieve food, uh, food security, nutrition security, but we also have a chance to actually create more employment opportunities. Uh, we have also listened to Namukolo, who again touched on these revolutions that are happening in this sector on nutrition, the global targets. Um, and what stood out for me is her point about how our diets need to be healthy, but also they need to ensure that we are, we are good for the, for the planet and how that could look like. And I think most of the presenters have been touching on that in one way or another. Uh, several presenters have also touched on the connections between our food, our food systems and our, and, our, and our health sector and the need for us to invest in that. Namukolo has gone into details talking about why we need to be investing in research and what kind of research that we need to be interesting to be investing in. I think it's particularly important because um, not only do we need to invest in research, but also multidisciplinary research and what areas these are. These are and there was the mention of capacity strengthening, which is really critical for the African continent. She also highlighted the need to, to generate evidence on the why and how questions, and as well understanding the landscape on which we are working in. And from the other presenters, we have heard about how this landscape is changing and how we need to be, uh, to be evolving with that. Now, I will move on to the questions, and I will start with you, Professor Eliane Ubalijoro. There have been several questions that have been posed to you, but I want to pick one question uh, concerning, um, actually two questions. There's this question about the average age of an African farmer. I always find that quite interesting. I'd like you to elaborate a little bit on that because you're working in a data institution. Uh, what kind of data do you have that informs that actually indeed the average farmer uh, age of an African farmer is 59 years old? Uh, and that, that, uh, that age came from one of the attendees. And then there's the question of how we may use uh, artificial intelligence to increase access uh, to, to agricultural data. Uh, over to you, Eliane. So one of the realities that uh, many of us who, who have gone on to very high levels of education do not realize is that farming in Africa today is less productive than it was uh, in the 1950s and 1960s. So the real income for a farmer who's in cocoa or in coffee today is lower than it was back then. And so this is partly linked to the decrease in solar organic carbon. And so younger generations are seeing their parents struggle and they're like, I don't wanna be in this. And part of the accelerated urbanization is all the youth that are leaving rural areas and going into cities and exploding the, the um, um, settlements that are, are not organized in the way that urbanization should be. And so the reality of, of this uh, elevated age of farmers is seen by the flux in urbanization and in young people coming into cities that do not find employment. And the way we can transform this is to bring digitalization to rural areas so youth in rural areas can be part of the productive agricultural productivity and be connected to cities. And you know, we've talked about the high rates of post-harvest uh, losses. If you think about it, if we had connectivity between rural areas and all the consumer um, buying areas in cities, we could accelerate transfer of goods and that's 50% increase in income we could have in agriculture just there. Because you want to be in positions where they're going to make money, where they're going to have sustainable livelihoods. However access you have of technology, they know that there are people with better lives out there and they want to figure out how to get there. And so it's really up to us as scientists to create the enabling conditions to make it sexy 
to make it profitable and to make it sustainable for youth to be engaged in rural areas and to produce in ways that that $110 billion that will be going to, to uh, importing food actually goes to our young population. Thank you very much, Eliane. Um, the next question I will pose to Professor Charles Wabebe, and this is from one of the attendees, Constance Gewa. Um, Professor Charles, thank you very much for your presentation, which I enjoyed. On uh, I have enjoyed some insect-based dishes in Africa. Would you please comment on sustainability of use and access to insects in supporting food and nutrition security? Over to you, Charles. Professor Wabebe, if you can hear us, um, I have posed a question to you, otherwise I'm Hello? Professor, yes, we'll have to mute. Continue. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, great, great. Thank you, Steve Grace. Yes, uh, we had our first um, African conference on edible insects in, in uh, Harare last year. And um, we were quite impressed that um, there are some indigenous uh, technologies uh, using electric bulb to cultivate and farm edible insects in Zimbabwe and some other countries. But the technology that was really able to give us a foresight into sustaining this kind of uh, uh, farming has been developed mainly in Europe. Uh, unfortunately, in fact, um, at that meeting, we were informed that most of this research done so far on edible insects, African edible insects, have been done by Europeans using our insects. In fact, over 90%. So one of the challenges is for us in Africa to, do, to try to invest more and do more research and uh, adapt technology that is already available in Europe for farming edible insects. It's through farming and of course, most of these edible insects, they depend on uh, trees. So it's a circle. We have to also look at the trees which they depend on and how to be able to maintain them so that all year round, we can be able to have the ins edible insects on our table because a lot of them are seasonal. But if we're able to uh, look at the, the best way to maintain the uh, availability of this um, uh, uh, trees, which they depend on, and then use um, uh, the new technology to farm the uh, edible insects all year round. That will now be able to sustain this uh, uh, new initiative in terms of being able to encourage uh, people not only to farm going to this technology, but also to eat it. There is um, the first, as far as we know, the first. Uh, um, restaurant in South Africa that deals with only insects, insect products, is in Cape Town. And in fact, at that conference in uh, Addis Ababa, the uh, sorry, at um, uh, Harare, the young lady, a white lady, was there who you know started it, and uh, she was able to make it insect products, you know, in ways that can be attractive because. Most people, when they see insect on the table, they don't want to eat it. <laughs> so, uh, but she is, uh, it was quite a good uh, initiative. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, Prof. Bebe. Uh, I will take the next question, and this one will go to Larry. Uh, Larry, uh, this one comes from uh, Giosse. How do we educate the business or stroke food industry to communicate and promote the fact that profit and optimum nutrition can be achieved simultaneously? They're not mutually exclusive. Um, as you respond to that, I'd like to just alert our participants that soon after we take it, we finish taking a couple of questions, we'll go to the prioritization exercise where you'll have um, uh, another chance to make a contribution to this conversation. Uh, over to you, Larry. That's a, that's a very good question. Um, it's important for us to note that in the last, in the last 15, 20 years, we have seen a, a significant shift in the way industries approach the whole issues around nutrition, 
around sustainability, around gender, uh, it is quite obvious, and I, I don't think anybody begrudges the industry that profit is important. Profit is one is an important reason for industries to operate. But the industries themselves have also begun to understand that profit is not enough, that they need to worry about the other um, bottom lines, and that would be around um, um, sustainability, they need to worry about uh, their consumers, they need to worry about nutrition. But we as a community whether, uh, uh, of scientists or researchers, or even development, uh, uh, development sector um, uh, partners, need to understand that we should make it very clear when we are selling any concept to the industry, that one, that it will address a social issue, no doubt about that, but at the same time, it will be a profitable business for the industry. So I, I, think, it, I think it's a responsibility of all stakeholders to understand that you, one, industry needs to make money, but two, industry is also able to see the opportunity. And so as we, when we think of ideas, we need to sell the opportunities as well. What would be the opportunity? It could be increased market. Um, it, um, it could also be opportunity to, opportunity to introduce new products as well. So we should not expect that industry would jump up just because the idea is nice from an academic or research point of view, but we, it must, one, it must speak to the bottom line from a financial point of view, and then it must also then address uh, other social issues around employment, around uh, nutrition, around health and curse. But I think we're, we're beginning to see a stronger alignment these days than 10, 15 years ago. Thanks very much, Larry. I'll take one last question and then I'll hand over to Moses. Uh, Namukola, this is for you. Um, and this comes from Elizabeth Marinkola. Uh, and actually, this was a general question, but allow me to pose it to you. Are any of the speakers uh, aware of the incentives that exist whether government or market-based, in light of the dramatic transition from communicable diseases to NCDs uh, and the rise in overweight and especially uh, sort of uh, uh, interventions to support farmers transition from grow uh, growing healthy crops. Over to you, Namukolo. Um, the issue of non-communicable diseases is, is, is complicated. Um, it's not so much necessarily what the farmer is growing, but what we do with the food once it, once it, it comes off from the farm. Um, so one of the things that we know is contributing to increased overweight or obesity is the increased energy density of the foods that we now consumed, increased um, from fat and oils, uh, highly processed foods, so a lot of the attentions for interventions that are ongoing now are towards, on the one hand, we want to improve the diet diversity of people's diet, but we want to do it in such a way that we, 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 we are not increasing the wrong types of food uh, to be consumed. There are some countries that have um, started doing something about it, uh, the best example I can give you is South Africa. Uh, South Africa now has a mandatory salt legislation that limits the amount of salt that can be put in by food processors in processed foods. And this was from the realization that for some sectors of the population, most of the salt consumption actually comes already in the food. So they don't actually have a choice. And so the legislation was put into place. So it limits the amount of salt that can be put in bread, in breakfast cereals and other processed foods. The other thing that they have done recently is that they, they introduced a sugar tax in, the law in I think 2016. Um, it remains to be seen what impact that has had. Uh, but we know that in other places like Mexico, where it has been introduced, it has had some positive impact. So there are, people do realize we have a problem, but the trouble, and that's where I think research can contribute, is to figure out what type of regulatory and policy instruments might be effective. But not only that, how can we incentivize 
for example, the private sector to produce uh, foods that are actually more conducive to attaining better nutrition outcomes. Thank you. Very many thanks, Anamukolo. Over to you, Moses. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, um, so I just need to check again uh, with uh, Professor Sunita. Uh, it will still be um, good if you can just, even if it's not talking from your slides, uh, just uh, you know, make some few remarks from what you've had so far. Um, I think it's important to just know which name, uh, if it's possible to uh, maybe maybe it's the name on your computer because we cannot see. Uh, there you are. Um, so I can see your green. Um, your your mic is green, meaning that you, we should be able to hear you. But uh, could you could you just try and uh, talk to us uh, if you can? Yes, Professor. I can hear you, Moses. Can you hear me now? Oh, there you are. Thank you. Thank you very much. So. Okay, great. Uh, Nice to nice to yes. be with you all again. I've been listening to some of you for the past, let's say, ten minutes. But since I'm on my mobile, I can't show you my slides. But uh, can I just say a few things then, right now? Yes. Before you yes, get the next question. Okay. Yeah. So while well, my presentation was supposed to be on climate change and the other challenges, um, since um, uh, I don't know what has been said before, I don't know whether I'll be repeating myself. So please bear with me. Uh, basically, I had some very interesting statistics for, for Africa, uh, not very good ones. For instance, 224 million people undernourished, hunger being uh, on the rise. Of 135 million acutely food insecure people uh, in the world, 73 million are in Southern Africa and the Horn of Africa alone. And this situation is getting worse. Uh, there's uh, increase in poverty levels and migration of males to urban areas and feminization of the agricultural workforce. So the situation is, is, is dramatic. Uh, now we understand that the situation is mostly driven by climate change and conflicts, but then we have unprecedented pest outbreaks such as the locust uh, this year and army worms a, a few years ago. And then now we have the COVID pandemic so all of which are making things a lot worse. The main issues for food insecurity have been covered by previous speakers, so I won't go into that. For instance, homogeneous diets and only eight or nine crops accounting for 70% of all crop production. Uh, there's food wastage and loss, about 50% coming from Africa alone. And the fact that uh, agriculture also has impact on the environment for instance, we know 70% of water extracted from nature goes into agriculture. There is 60% biodiversity loss due to agricultural activities, and agriculture generates up to one third of all the anthropogenic uh, greenhouse gases. The 2018 report of the World Met Organization on the state of the global climate is very clear. Climate change situation is worsening, and Southern Africa is warming at twice the global rate and 22.2 uh, million people were severely food insecure at the end of 2019. Cyclones, droughts, floods, landslides have left 33 million people homeless. That was just in uh, 2019. What is worrying is of these 16 million were children. And uh, with, with uh, these kind of figures, we really have to um, uh, pull up uh, our socks and get our act right. There's also the issue of what climate change does to uh, nourishment in the, in the food that we eat. It's been shown that when you grow crops under high levels of carbon dioxide, wheat, rice, maize, soya bean have less zinc, less iron, and less protein. So it's not just a question of having sufficient food uh, or, or even nutritious food. Climate change effects on the nutrition is something that we haven't really studied sufficiently, and that's an area that we really need to research. There are other issues which have been touched upon. I heard somebody mention about decreasing soil fertility. There's also salinization of uh, soils and uh, desertification, drought during the late uh, 2080s and early 2090s. And this was followed by heavy rains, as we know, in 2019, which led to the emergence of the locust swamps. The, the, the droughts and the floods themselves have created a lot of, uh, of difficulties in terms of food security, access to farmlands, loss of livelihood, 
no drinking water supplies, uh, high risk of disease, waterborne diseases. But then came, of course, this COVID as a result of climate change and the drought followed by the, the rains, heavy rains. Uh, then we have the, uh, so, sorry, did I say COVID? I meant the locust swamps. The locust swamps uh, came as a result of the climatic conditions, drought followed by, by rain. And East Africa, as we know, is currently experiencing the worst outbreak of locusts, 70 years uh, for Kenya, 25 years for Somalia in Ethiopia. And just to give you some figures, 35,000 people's food can be consumed in one day by just one square kilometer of locusts. So we're talking of, of uh, serious, uh, serious uh, damage here. Uh, then we also had the fall army worm a few years ago, which also has created a, a havoc uh, to food security. So if you look at army worms, we're looking at COVID-19, we're looking at, at uh, locusts. None of these were created or none of these emerged in, on the African continent. The COVID-19, we don't know where it came from, but it has affected Africa. The fall army worm came from somewhere in South America. The uh, locust swamps too have, have come from, well, it started uh, um, in, in East Africa and now it's, it's spreading. Not of our making, but it's affecting African food security the worst. Population displacement, people are moving. 22 million people displaced with climate change and uh, related disasters being the top drivers of migration. Cyclones, the Kenneth and Idai in Zimbabwe, Malawi, and Mozambique, 200,000 people displaced. Risks of children being exploited, separated from their families, and dropping out of school. Now, this exacerbates poverty, inequality, destroys families, weakens the social fabric, reduces children's access to health and education, and ruins the capacity of future generations. However, having said that, population or movement of people is also a survival strategy. It's a critical survival or resilience strategy. And as we saw this year with the COVID, when people are unable to move, this traps them and makes them extremely vulnerable to whatever threat they're facing already. There is also the issue of mental health. This is a relatively new field of inquiry, climate change and mental health. Not a lot of work has been done. People suffering from severe depression and post-traumatic stress disorders and other mental health problems. And this is worse in developing countries because often the symptoms go untreated and unchecked. Um, I'm sure other speakers have talked about COVID, where the lockdown has created logistical challenges to our farmers, shortage of uh, labor inputs, uh, shortage of other farm inputs, closure of transport and marketing systems, partial or complete food loss in the fields after harvest, and loss of livelihoods, where we saw millions of farmers becoming refugees as a result of the virus. It also made food, food inaccessible to people because of increase in prices. There was also increase in food loss because partly because of disruptions in the supply chain and also partly because of panic buying, people buying excessive amounts of food, which they are then unable to store properly. And this leads, uh, this has led to a lot of loss. So the, fa the famine early warning system network, Global Food Security Alert has warned that populations in northeastern Nigeria, South Sudan and Yemen could face famine as a consequence of the pandemic. In Somalia, the latest data indicates that 3.5 million people are projected to be in IPC phase three, which is the food insecurity phase classification. And by September, there'll be a threefold increase compared to uh, early this year. Having said all that, COVID-19 has also created conditions for people to rethink the food future. It has challenged the global community to readdress environment, food, health, equity, governance, and leadership issues differently from the way we've been doing so far, differently from a purely profit-oriented commercial model. It has given us a chance, as somebody, uh, as I read somewhere, to press the reset button and sue sustainability into the very DNA of our existence. So we, 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 we know we are not on track with the SDGs. In fact, not only are we not on track, the progress has been completely reversed in many cases. So it's not just food security which is being threatened, but it's also undermining development gains that have taken years for the continent to build. 
and I'm referring particularly to climate change, to floods, droughts, disasters, locust, army worms, all of which are related to climate change. And then, of course, COVID. We don't know whether it has a climate change uh, component and element, but it, it's it's added to it's exacerbated the existing uh, situation. With all of these things happening, even the humanitarian and global aid systems are being stretched and thinned out and it's making it more and more difficult to provide the same level of help. So what should be our approach for food and security, food and nutrition security in Africa? Building resilience is the key development priority. We need to reconnect agriculture with ecosystem services. And I'm referring to climate mitigation, biodiversity protection, water, soil, air, all of these things. So we need to practice, we need to learn to practice agriculture, keeping in mind ecosystem services. Uh, we need to increase our understanding and assessment of zoonotic risks, that is those diseases that are transmitted from animals to humans, and set up measures to prevent and mitigate these risks. So what do we need? Our farmers are good at innovating and adapting. They need policies that will protect them and increase their resilience. They need access to information, information about climatic conditions, on pest and disease early warning systems, on market trends, access to technology, digitization, as the, as the earlier speaker said, access to new farm inputs, to credit, insurance, all of them enveloped in supportive policies and frameworks. And above all of this, they need their voice to be heard. We also need our, our youth, we need to encourage our youth to take to agriculture and agribusiness. Somebody mentioned how we could make it attractive. Somebody used the word sexy. Yes, I like that word. We need to make agribusiness sexy and attractive, glamorous to our youth. And how can we do that? We need to change the way we practice agriculture, make it more information-based. Information about the climate, market, uh, agronomic practices, inputs. We need to remove the drudgery from, from agriculture. Agriculture is hard work. We need to remove that hard work. How can we do that? Outsource, outsource activities. This could in itself be a small and medium enterprise somebody specializing in only planting, some a small firm specializing in weeding, a small firm specializing in harvesting. So outsource the drudgery. We need to put in place safety nets, safety nets for insurance, through insurance, credit uh, facilities, soft loans, digitization, as somebody has already mentioned, new technologies, for instance, drones, computer assisted sensors for decision making, for soil, for irrigation, for fertilization. There are a number of new farming approaches, climate smart agriculture, for instance, agroforestry, protected cultivation, rooftop farming, vertical farming, aquaponics. Aquaponics is where you grow crops together with fish in the same system. So these are new farming approaches that our youth would find more attractive than the age old way of doing things. And then of course, we need to provide them with technical institutional policy and fiscal support. There are a large number of ongoing efforts. For instance, we have the CCAFS report this year on actions to transform food systems under climate change. There are four action areas specified with 11 transformative actions within them. And they're designed, they're proposed to bring about systemic transformation of our food systems. And they include rerouting farming and rural livelihoods to new trajectories. De-risking livelihoods, farms, and value chains, I'm quoting from the report, reduce emissions from diets and value chains, and realign policies, finance, support to social movements and innovation. This is the CCAPS report. We also have the UNEP 2020 program on recalibrating humanity's relationship with nature, transforming the way we produce and consume food, to identify knowledge gaps and adopt comprehensive food systems approach studying the importance of net positive agriculture, putting in place actions for a net positive agriculture so that we can shift towards a regenerative agriculture that can play an important role in sustainable food systems and preventing further zoonotic outbreaks. There is a global COVID-19 humanitarian response plan. Now this has recently been revised right, just a few weeks ago to include non-health components and food security is one of the major non-health component in that. It is in fact the largest non-health component uh, at $1.6 billion. 
there is a new concept being developed on nutrition smart agriculture. The aim is to provide diversified, safe, and nutrient rich foods while increasing farm or agribusiness level productivity and revenues, which, as we know, are the main drivers for any agribusiness investment. There is the climate action proposal, proposal from the climate action group, who talks of building back better, building back green, and building back resilient. So there are a lot of these ongoing efforts, but we still need to, to step them up and make them inclusive, include our farmers, hear their voice, and it should not be a top-down approach, but rather a, a, a participatory approach. And in conclusion, I would like to say that the greatest challenge we face today is producing food that is sufficient, nutritious, affordable, and environmentally sustainable for everyone. The solutions exist. They're practical nature-based solutions. They are within our control, but what they require for us to actually make them possible is radical transformative changes in mentality, attitudes, and practices. We have to invest in more resilient systems, enhance environmental and social protections, and rebuild a more equitable world for people and for the planet. We need strong leadership. We need a holistic farm to forge approach, which includes reducing supply chain inefficiencies and supporting consumers. So looking at both the supply as well as the demand side in order to make healthy and sustainable dietary choices. So with all of these, I think we would be able to move forward towards the dream of having a food secure Africa. I thank you. Thank you so much, Professor, for those uh, remarks. So we will, we will now move to um, a session where we hear from you, uh, which is really kickstarting our priority setting exercise. And to just explain it a little bit more, um, the way we do it at the African Academy of Sciences, of course, there are many ways of doing this um, kind of an exercise. We first hear from, um, well, we, we start with a desk review. And uh, so far uh, from the steering committee and the uh, desk review of the few papers that we've been able to go through, I think our current list is somewhere around 48 uh, distinct uh, priorities for the African continent. We would like to expand those as much as possible. So the next session, uh, the Mentimeter session, um, and I'd just like to have a look at those slides uh, if, if they're there. We are going to be posting a link. Uh, so Angeline, if you can uh, post the link for the Mentimeter session so that uh, colleagues on the call can actually be able to go to the link um, either through your whatever device you're using uh, and then you have an opportunity of answering some few questions which will assist us in expanding this uh, uh, list and then um, after we combine and put it into our, our report uh, alongside it and in parallel we are going to put together a survey, which we will send out to practitioners, scientists, researchers, investigators in uh, food and nutrition security on the continent. And then from whatever number of priorities that we are going to get from them, and uh, of course, there'll be a bit of waiting to say which ones are more important than the others, according to them, uh, we will formulate uh, a report that uh, we will definitely be uh, you know, uh, in collaboration with um, our colleagues at AUDA. And I know that uh, Daphne, Bibi, Kefilwe, and Modupe, you're on the line. Um, we know that uh, you also asked one or two questions that were probably not answered because of time, but uh, um, we will definitely work with you to uh, now uh, bring advocacy uh, to the um, eventual priorities that would have been released from this piece of work. So um, the Mentimeter link, please, is it is it there? Just checking if it's there. So we are going to be doing five, five questions. 
for the Mentimeter. Um, Angeline, if you're ready, over to you so that you can take us through this session. We know that we've run late, uh, probably by around 15 minutes, but we, it, we, we think that uh, it is important to just hear from you as you answer these questions. Uh, you will definitely assist us in uh, expanding the priority list as it is at the moment. Um, feel free to uh, put in your comments, thoughts uh, as you answer the questions. And if there's any chance that uh, you can refer us to any form of document that you think we can gain more, then we will definitely be happy to uh, follow those. Um, checking again. Uh, Angeline, are you, are you on the line? Yes, I'm back. I just lost connection. Okay, good. Um, and then, um, could you share with us the link to the Mentimeter? Yes, it's shared in the chat box. In the chat I can box. Yes. I will just resend it. Okay. Send it again, please. So we beg your indulgence, um, because we, we lost uh, 15 minutes somewhere, uh, we beg your indulgence, uh, if you all may, um, because our thought is that we'll probably need an extra 15 minutes for us to complete. Okay, thank you, Angeline. Uh, so um, in your chat box, uh, hoping that all of you have an opportunity to, to, to get there, um, there's a link uh, written HTTPS uh, www.menti.com. If you click on that link, it will take you to um, it will take you to Menti Mentimeter. Uh, so just checking if anyone has been able to actually get to Mentimeter through that link. Um, any, any one of the panelists, if you've been able to do that, uh, please confirm. Namkolo, I have been able to. Okay, brilliant. So the link is working. I'm waiting for people to uh, join. And or confirm. Uh, let us hear from anyone else. Uh, has anyone else been able to get onto the link before we begin? Yes, I have. This is Larry. Okay, brilliant. Okay, so the link is working. Um, over to you, Angie. Um, I'm guessing you are going to be uh, taking us through the Mentimeter session. Angela? Yes, thank you, Moses. Thank you, Moses, and uh, thank you, everyone. Th welcome to this interactive section. And due to connectivity issues, we will give each person one minute. I will be timing you for one minute to ensure there is full participation. And I will prompt you to submit the questions per slide so that we move simultaneously. So I'm hoping everybody is able to see the first slide. So at the count of one, let's start with the first slide. So it's called the wisdom of the crowds, um, and uh, quite uh, some bit of research has gone into this particular exercise that um, we are trying out. And uh, at the end of it all, the the main question uh, is usually around: um, is the question that is trying to be sorted out a simple question, or is the question that is trying to be sorted out a wicked question? Um, and uh, people have shown over and over again that uh, if it is a simple question, the experts usually lose or are far away from the truth, but, uh, and, and the general public wins. Uh, but uh, if it is a wicked question like the ones uh, we are actually looking at, then the, the experts essentially uh, win. Um, very interesting work on that one. So um, just to, that's, that's the word cloud. Uh, it's, a, it's a bit small, you may not be able to see everything, but uh, clearly at the middle of it, uh, you know, a majority of you mentioned climate change. 
as uh, one of the biggest challenges that we need to think about as the uh, African continent. Let's go to number two. Sorry. Can you see my presentation? Uh, yes, it's there. Uh, so number two is essentially a list. Um, uh, so I will not go through the list, uh, but it asked about the major areas that uh, investments in science, research and development should focus on. And uh, this is all that you're telling us uh, about uh, trying to be multi-sectoral, local solutions, biotechnology, ethnography, uh, sustainability, you know, uh, taking care of the neglected, sustainable agriculture, smallholders, market integration. Uh, all of them are important. We think um, they'll definitely go into our list that uh, we will eventually present to um, um, uh, other experts on the African continent. Question number three, please. And uh, so this is not it, uh, but uh, it was it was more of like teasing you as as experts more than anything else, trying to find out. Okay, so what are those five five areas, and which ones should we really be focusing on? And as you can see there, um, there is uh, climate resilient food system, uh, high uh, technologies, innovations, and enterprises following it. Uh, food sovereignty surprising at 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 number five uh, again. Um, this is just to get us thinking about uh, how we are currently thinking as a group uh, and to just keep in mind that uh, what, what other people are also thinking about. Uh, so that's how it's looking. Number four. And uh, um, immediately we finish this, I'll be asking uh, Professor Wambembe to uh, make a few comments about what he has seen so far in uh, this uh, mini prioritization exercise that we are going to use to build uh, on, on our work. Uh, again, these are the best buys. Uh, best buys is basically WHO language, but uh, if you are to think about the best investments, uh, so market systems, data, is there indigenous knowledge, uh, toolbox for in, in interventions, um, understanding causes of uh, food and nutrition security, market infrastructure, translational research and communication. I won't go through them. Uh, we do have them. We will definitely integrate them into the, the work so far. And then lastly, lastly, number five, uh, again, it is uh, a word cloud, but you can see that uh, um, the major stakeholders, most of you say farmers, uh, researchers also is uh, quite big, governments, development partners, consumers, academia, and then other. I'm really surprised. Policymakers is really, really small, uh, barely visible. Uh, but again, uh, it's, it's, it's just a, a capture of what's top of mind for us at this particular moment. Uh, Professor Ambembe, if you're available, um, could you just make a few, you know, even if it's a half a minute, comment on uh, what you have seen so far and um, um, any relationship to the work that you've done so far? Professor? Yes, thank you, Moses. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Oh, good, good, good. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't say the result, but I'm quite impressed that. Um, Many of our participants have still hanging around two hours uh, plus. We are, I'm quite impressed with that. And I'm also happy that um, the results are adding more information to what we already have, which will help us in uh, moving forward. And of course, I'm, I'm confident that um, the, all uh, the participants today at this uh, round table will receive the survey documents so they will have more time to think through uh, in the area of prioritizing uh, the in food and nutrition security in Africa. I think uh, I won't go through what Moses had already said. Uh, those are just uh, the words I want to share with you. I appreciate uh, the sacrifice of all our participants to stay this late, especially for those in East Africa. Uh, and I uh, look forward to the um, survey. That's the next thing. So have a wonderful evening. God bless you all.
Good. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. Really appreciate. Um, if you want a copy of uh, uh, what this small exercise that we've done, it is available to you from Mentimeter. Um, if you were to just go back to your screen, uh, you can get it by email or print it. Okay, so as we close, um, could we now invite uh, Victor, Victor Ajiro. Uh, Victor Ajiro um, uh, is in Nigeria and, uh, you know, works with the, you know, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, one of our uh, partners for this piece of work. Um, so I think uh, it is important to, to hear um, from you, Victor, especially because we know that you lead a portfolio of investments and uh, initiatives uh, that intersect with the uh, nutrition a range of systems in uh, food health and social protection in uh, some of the countries in Africa. So, um, Victor, over to you. And then after you, we will have uh, Marcus Moll, um, who is a research advisor at CEDARS Research Corporation Unit and uh, works with us quite closely in implementing some of the programs that we undertake uh, here at the African Academy of Sciences. Um, and then after that, uh, we will uh, get to the executive director, Professor Nelson Toto, to close it for us. Uh, so, Victor, please. All right, thank you very much, Moses, and greetings to everyone. And uh, we want to express our appreciation for this successful platform that we just had and the webinar and all the presenters. I think the times in which are now very crucial for discussing and advancing the issue of food and nutrition security in Africa. We all know that COVID is our new reality. And even before COVID, the issue of food and nutrition security uh, has been very dire for us in Africa. And so every effort to accelerate progress becomes increasingly important. And so that's why platforms like this that helps to elevate the profile of innovations uh, and the place of rigorous prioritization uh, in science and research uh, is quite key for Africa in advancing food and nutrition security. And so we really appreciate the fact and the partnership with Africa uh, Academy of Science uh, through our Grand Challenges program as the Gates Foundation and seeing how we are advancing these important thoughts, important innovations, creating a culture of inquiry, challenging the status quo and paradigms, and seeing really how to make progress and faster progress a reality. We're very keen to see how we continue with this. This process has been great. The input from different stakeholders have been great, and we're keen to remain engaged as this process evolves. So thank you very much as we keep in touch on this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Victor. Uh, appreciate those comments. Uh, Marcus, over to you. Uh, Marcus, you're still on mute. Uh, so unmute and then we can hear. From can you hear me? Can you yes, hear me now? We can. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Okay, thank you very much. I think uh, because time is uh, very short, I would just like to thank uh, all speakers and the particip participants for this uh, interesting uh, webinar and of course the team at the AS with uh, Moses and uh, colleagues for uh, organizing this uh, important uh, event. And uh, I think it will be really very exciting to take part in the detailed results of today's uh, priority setting exercise and the upcoming uh, survey and uh, I and, uh, and uh, see that we really hope that uh, this will lead to Grand Challenges Africa call, a call focusing on uh, highly important aspects of the food and nutrition security topic. Um, eradicating hunger and poverty is a priority for Swedish Development Corporation and to achieve this uh, addressing food and nutrition security uh, seems really essential, of essential uh, importance. And I think we cannot underestimate the importance of uh, food and nutrition security for healthy lives, for livelihood, for equality, and uh, education opportunities, to name uh, only a few things. Uh, and therefore, I would like to thank again the AS and the team for this important initiative. And we really look forward to our continued uh, partnership. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, um, Marcus. We look forward to uh, you know, completing this work successfully. Um, Professor Nelson Toto, 
I know you've been listening intently through the presentation since you set us off. Uh, so over to you, Professor. Um, Professor, you're on mute. Uh, so just unmute and then we can proceed. Thank, thank you, Moses. I thought I'd unmuted myself. Thank you very much. And thank you to everyone uh, for, for your contributions. I want to thank um, uh, our, our keynote speaker, Eliane, and also I want to thank the panelists for adding a lot of value to the discussions. I've had a lot of things that were very interesting. Data, digitization, food systems, insects, population, youth, uh, you know, transformative research, all those aspects came through. And um, I think it has been a very, very uh, uh, productive uh, uh, engagement and I want to particularly thank uh, Marcus uh, for coming on board. I think it's, it's it's one thing to fund or to be a partner to an organization that is doing work but to be involved to show interest as a funder I think it's it's something that is very key to us and we really appreciate the friendship and 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 and, and the support that we are getting from CEDA and, and and for CEDA to be making time to be part of this I think it's a very very um, uh, uh, good uh, gesture that shows that really we are in it as partners and we want to make sure that uh, this thing works for us. Let me take this opportunity to thank people behind the scenes, uh, those who were involved in terms of organizing this, uh, which is the steering committee. Uh, the members were Charles Wambebe, Namukolo, Kovic, Sunita as well, uh, Marcus Small and Victor. Uh, I want to thank you very much for all the work that you did, uh, which resulted in this um, a webinar being uh, much uh, of a success. Uh, let me also acknowledge some of the fellows that I saw participating in this webinar. Baldwin Toto, uh, who is not uh, a, a relation of mine by any sort, but is a good friend. Uh, Lisa Koston, uh, Paruma Amatojoya, uh, Simeon, as well as Charles and Delian. Uh, thank you very much. We always want to see fellows participating in these engagements because us at the Secretariat, really, we do work for the academy and we do work uh, so that we can really mobilize the fellows because we feel that the fellows are really the biggest resource that the academy has. Uh, so for that, we are really very grateful. Thank you, everyone, for staying this long. Have a good evening and hopefully we will engage further as we begin to articulate some of the priorities that have come from this engagement. Have a good night and thank you very much.